Hello everyone, welcome back to Korean Fairy Tales. This one is called The Home of the Fairies. So it definitely interests me. In the days of King In-Jo, 1623 to 1649, there was a student of Confucius who lived in Kapayong. He was still a young man and unmarried. His education had not been extensive, for he had read only a little in the way of history and literature. For some reason or other, he left his home and went into Kangwon province. Travelling on horseback and with a servant, he reached a mountain, where he was overtaken by rain and it wet him through. Mysteriously, from some unknown cause, his servant suddenly died. And the man, in fear and distress, drew the body to the side of the hill, where he unfortunately had to leave it and go on his way, weeping. When he had gone but a short distance, the horse he rode fell under him and died also. Such was his plight. His servant died. His horse died, rain falling fast, and the road an unknown one. He did not know what to do or where to go, and reduced us to walking. He broke down and cried. At this point, there met him an old man with very wonderful eyes, hair as white as snow. He asked the young man why he wept, and the reply was that his servant was dead, his horse was dead, and that it was raining, and that he did not know the way. The patriarch, on hearing this, took pity on him, lifting his staff but pointed at saying, There is a house yonder, just beyond those pines. Follow that stream. It will bring you to where there are people. The young man looked as directed, and a little or so beyond he saw a clump of trees. He bowed, thanked the stranger and started on his way. When he had gone a few paces, he looked back. But the friend had disappeared. Greatly wondering, he went on toward the place indicated, and as he drew near he saw a grove of pines. Huge trees they were, a whole forest of them. Bamboos appeared, too, in countless numbers, with a wide stream of water flowing by. Underneath the water there seemed to be marble flooring, like a great pavement white and pure. As he went along, he saw that the water was all of an even depth. Such one could cross easily, a mile or so further. On he saw a beautifully decorated house. The pillars and entrance approaches were perfect in form. He continued his way, wet as he was, carrying his thorn staff, and entered the gate and sat down to rest. It was paved, too, with marble, and smooth as polished glass. There were no chinks or creases in it, or was of one perfect surface. In the room was a marble table, and on it a copy of the Book of Changes. There was also a brazier of jade, just in front. Incense was burning in it, and the fragrance filled the room. Beside these, nothing else was visible. The rain had ceased and all was quiet and clear, with no wind nor anything to disturb. The world of confusion seemed to have receded from him. While he sat there, looking in astonishment, he suddenly heard the sound of footfalls from the rear of the building. Startled by it, he turned to see when an older man appeared. He looked as though he might equal the turtle or crane as to age, and was very dignified. He wore a green dress and carried a jade staff of nine sections. The appearance of the old man was much as to stun any inhabitants of the earth. He recognised him as the master of the place, and so he went forward and made a low obeisance. The old man received him kindly and said, I am the master and have long waited for you. He took him by the hand and led him away. 
As they went along, the hills grew more and more enchanting, with the soft breezes and the light that touched him with mystifying favour. As suddenly as he looked, the man was gone, so he went on by himself, and arrived soon at another palace, built likewise of precious stones. It was a great hall, stretching on into the distance as far as one's eye could see. The young man had seen the royal palace frequently when in Seoul attending examinations, but compared with this, the royal palace was as a mud but thatched with straw. As he reached the gate, a man in ceremonial robes received him and led him in. He passed to the three pavilions and at last reached a special one and went up to the upper story. There reclining at a table, he saw the ancient sage, whom he had met before. Again, he bowed. This young man, brought up poorly in the country, was never accustomed to seeing a dealing with the great. In fear, he did not dare lift his eyes. The ancient master, however, again welcomed him, and asked him to be seated, saying, This is not the dusty world that you are accustomed to, but the abode of the genie. I know you were coming, and so was waiting to receive you. He turned and called, saying, Bring something for the guest to eat. In a swift moment, a little servant brought a richly laden table. It was such fare as was never even seen on earth, and there was abundance of it. The young man, hungry as he was, ate heartily of these strange viands. Then the dishes were carried away, and the old man said, I have a daughter who has arrived at a marriageable age. I have been trying to find a son-in-law, but as yet have not succeeded. Your coming accords with this need. Live here, then, and become my son-in-law. The young man, not knowing what to think, bowed and was silent. Then the host turned and gave an order, saying, Call in the children. Two boys, about twelve or thirteen years of age, came in and sat down beside him. Their faces were beautifully white. They seemed like jewels. The master pointed them and said to the guest, These are my sons. And to the sons he said, This young man is he whom I have chosen for my son-in-law. When should we have the wedding? Choose you a lucky day, and let me know. The two boys reckoned over the days on the fingers, and then together said, The day after tomorrow is a lucky day. The old man, turning to the stranger, said, That decides as to the wedding. Now you must wait in the guest chamber till the time arrives. He then gave a command to call so-and-so. In a little, an official of the genie came forward, dressed in light and airy garments. His appearance and expression were very beautiful. A man, he seemed, of glad and happy means. The master said, Show this young man the way to his apartments, and treat him well until the time of the wedding. The official then led the way, and the young man bowed as he left the room. When he had passed outside the gate, a red sedan chair was in the waiting for him. He was asked to mount. Eight bearers bore him smoothly along. A mile or so distant they reached another palace, equally wonderful, with no speck or flaw of any kind to mar its beauty. In graceful groves of flowers and trees, he descended to enter his pavilion. Beautiful garments were taken from jewelled boxes, and a perfumed bath was given to him, and a change made. Thus he laid aside his weather-beaten clothes and donned the vestments of the genie. The official remained as company for him till the appointed time. When that day arrived, other beautiful robes were brought, and again he bathed, and again he did change. When he was dressed, he mounted the palaquin and rode to the palace of the master. Twenty more officials accompanying. 
On arrival, a guide directed them to the special palace. Beautiful it was. Here he saw preparations for the wedding, and here he made his bow. This finished, he moved as directed further in. The tinkling sound of jay bells and the breath of sweet perfumes filled the air. Thus he made his entry into the inner quarters. Many beautiful women were waiting, all gorgeously apparelled like the woman of the gods. Among these, he imagined that he would meet the master's daughter. In a little, accompanied by a host of others, she came shining in jewels and beautiful clothing so that she lighted up the palace. He took his stand before her, though her face was hidden from him by a fan of pearls. When he saw her at last, so beautiful was she that his eyes were dazzled. The other women compared with her, but as magpie to the phoenix. So bewildered was he that he dared not look up. The friend accompanying assisted him to bow and to go through the necessary forms. The ceremony was much the same as that observed among men. When it was over, the young man went back to his bridegroom's chamber. There, the embroidered curtains, the golden screens, the silken clothing, the jewel floor, were such as no man on earth would have ever seen. On the second day, his mother-in-law called him to her. Her age would be about thirty, her face was like a freshly blown lotus flower. Here a great feast was spread, with many guests invited. The accompaniments thereof, in the way of music, were sweeter than mortals ever dreamed of. When the feast was over, the women caught up their skirts and, lifting their sleeves, danced together and sang in sweet accord. The sound of their singing caused even the clouds to stop and listen. When the day was over, and all had well dined, the feast broke up. A young man brought up in a country but had all of a sudden met the thief of the genie and had become a sharer in his glory and the accompaniments of his life. His mind was dazed and his thoughts overcame him. Doubts were mixed with fears. He knew not what to do. A sharer in the joys of the fairies he had actually become, and a year or so passed in such delight as no words can ever describe. One day his wife said to him, Would you like to enter into the inner enclosure and see as the fairies see? He replied, Gladly would I. She then led him into a special park where there were lovely walks surrounded by green hills. As they advanced, there were charming views with springs of water and sparkling cascades. The scene grew gradually more enchanting with jewelled flowers, lovely birds, animals disporting themselves. A man once entering here would never again think of earth as a place to return to. After seeing this, he ascended the highest peak of all, which was like a tower of many stories. Before him lay a wide stretch of sea, with islands of the blessed standing out of water, and long stretches of pleasant land in view. His wife showed them all to him, pointing out this and that. They seemed filled with golden palaces, and surrounded with a halo of light. They were peopled with happy souls, some riding on cranes, some on phoenix, some on unicorn, some were sitting on the clouds, some sailing by on the wind, some just walking on the air, gliding gently up the streams, some descending from above, some ascending from moving west, some north, some gathering in groups, flutes and harps sounded sweetly, so many and so startling were the things seen that he could never tell a tale of them. After the day had passed, they returned. This was their joy unbroken, and when two years had gone by, she bore him two sons. Time moved on when one day, unexpectedly, as he was seated with his wife, he began to cry. Tears soiled his face. She asked in amazement for the cause of it. I was thinking, said he, of how a plain countryman living in poverty had thus become the son-in-law of the king of the genie. But 
in my home and my poor old mother, whom I have not seen for three for these years. I would so like to see her that my tears flow. The wife laughed and said, Would you really like to see her? Then go, but do not cry. She told her father that her husband would like to go and see his mother. The master called him and gave him his permission. The son thought, of course, that he would call many servants and send him in state, but not so. His wife gave him one little bundle. That was all. So he said goodbye to his father-in-law, whose parting word was, Go now and see your mother, and in a little I shall call for you again. He sent with him one servant, and so he passed out through the main gateway. There he saw a poor thin horse, which wore a rag for a saddle on its back. He looked carefully and found that they were the dead horse and the dead servant whom he had lost. Restored to him, he gave a start. How did you come here? The servant answered. I was coming with you on the road, and someone caught me away and brought me here. I did not know the reason, but I've been here for a long time. The man, in great fear, fastened to his bundle and startled on his journey. The genie servant brought up the rear, but after a short distance the world of wonder had become transformed to the old weary world again. Here it was, with its fogs and thorn and precipice. He looked off towards the world of the genie, and it was but a dream. So overcome was he by his feelings that he broke down and cried. The genie servant said to him when he saw him weeping, You have been for several years in the abode of the unmortals, but you have not yet attained thereto, for you have not yet forgotten the seven things of a anger, sorrow, fear, ambition, hate and selfishness. If you once get rid of these, there will be no tears for you. On hearing this, he stopped crying, wiped his cheeks, and asked pardon. When he had gone a mile further, he found himself on the main road. The servant said to him, You know the way from this point on, so I shall go back. And thus at last, the young man reached his home. He found there an exercise in ceremony in progress. Witches and spirit worshippers had been called, and were saying their prayers. The family, seeing the young man come home thus, were all aghast. It is his ghost, they said. However, they saw in a little that it was really him himself. The mother asked why he had not come home in all the time, she being a very violent woman in disposition. He did not dare to tell her the truth, so he made up something else. The day of his return was the anniversary of his supposed death, and so they all called the witches for a prayer ceremony. He reopened the bundle that his wife had given him, and found four suits of clothes, one for each season. In about a year after his return home, the mother, seeing him alone, made application for the daughter of one of the village literae, the man, being timid by nature and afraid of offending his mother, did not dare to refuse, and was therefore married. But there was no joy in it, and the two never looked at each other. The young man had a friend whom he had known intimately from childhood. After his return, the friend came to see him frequently. They used to spend the nights talking together. In their talks, the friend inquired why, in all these years, he had never come home. The young man then told him what had befallen him in the land of Genie, and how he had been there and been married. The friend looked at him in wonder, for he seemed just as he remembered, except in the matter of clothing. This he found an examination was a very strange material, and neither grass, cloth, silk, nor cotton, but different from them all, yet warm and comfortable. When spring came, the spring clothes sufficed. When summer came, those for summer, and for autumn and winter each special suit. They were never washed, and yet never became soiled. They were never worn out. They always looked fresh and new. The friend was greatly astonished. 
Some three years passed, when one day there came once more a servant from the master of Genie, bringing his two sons. There were also letters saying, Next year, the place where you dwell will be destroyed, and all the people will become fish and meat for the enemy. Therefore, follow this messenger, and come, all of you. He told his friend of this, and showed him his two sons. The friend, when he saw these children that looked like silk and jade, confessed the matter to the mother also. She too gladly agreed, and so they sold out, and had a great feast for all the people of the town, and bade farewell. This was the year, 1635. They left we never heard of again. The year following was the Manchu invasion, when the village where the young man had lived was all destroyed. To this day, young and old in Kapyong tell this very same story. The end. And that's the story of well, I guess Korean fairies, where the Korean fairies live, the Jean in the Jinai. Um, it's very interesting and very different and I really like it. Thank you for listening and many blessings.